Welcome to the Avalon Institute Wired to Lead podcast with your hosts Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. The Avalon Institute is on a mission to understand how individuals, teams, and leaders connect with others and the strategies they deploy to achieve the highest levels of success. Before each show, our guests take the Avalon Institute's Cognitive Peak Profile, available on our website at www.avalonleadership.com, and we discuss their unique cognitive leadership strengths. Thanks again for joining us, and here are your hosts, Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. And here we are. Welcome to another edition of the Wired to Lead podcast. Today, we are joined by Pete York. Uh, Pete is a principal uh, partner, principal associate, excuse me, at uh, Community Science. Um, He's going to be jumping in in a couple of minutes here, and we will be uh, going over his unique uh, cognitive peak profile. He's taken the assessment, um, and his scoring is very, very compelling. He'll be talking about uh, his perception of it and the nuances behind that. Uh, but first, what I want to do as well is introduce my wonderful co-host here, uh, Cameron Gott. Uh, Cameron is our partner here at the Avalon Institute, and um, Cam is uh, is, is uh, good to join us today here. Uh, we don't necessarily go in a in a specific pattern here for the uh, for the broadcast because we we uh, we tape them, we shoot them. Uh, we are getting into the holiday season; everybody's pretty busy. But uh, it's good to have everybody here today. How you doing today, Cam? Perry, I'm doing real well. Thanks for asking. So, and I'm looking forward to speaking with Pete today. Yeah, that's good stuff. Well, Pete has, uh, Pete has joined us here. Um, it is going to be very exciting because, as I mentioned, his scoring is very compelling. For anyone who's not joined us uh, for the Wired to Lead podcast, we, we specifically go over uh, what, what, an assessment that we actually have on, available on our website uh, called the Cognitive Peak Profile Assessment. Uh, If you go to www.avalonleadership.com, it's pretty simple. You join us uh, at what we say, join us at the Avalon Roundtable. That's free. Uh, Type in a little bit of data. Um, There's no cost to that. And then if you'd like to purchase the assessment, um, you can do that very easily. Uh, You set up your own account. You can access it whenever you like to. But the, the reason that we get excited about it is because the Cognitive Peak Profile uh, identifies what what we define as uh, hardwired traits in your brain. Um, in other words, the, the cognitive activities that your brain does efficiently, and uh, you know, as opposed to those that it may do a little bit more inefficiently. So, uh, I, I think you can kind of look at this as uh, a bit of a muscle. Um, you know, it, uh, for me specifically, uh, I'm a bit of a lower reader. I, I'm just not as efficient uh, in my processing about reading. Um, that doesn't make me necessarily a bad reader, Cam. I, I, I love to read, but I read differently. Uh, so, so I know that I have to flex that muscle a little bit differently. I, I tend to do skim reading. I do highlight reading, as they say. Uh, I might read the end of an article, uh, uh, and then I track back if I'm really interested in it. So there's, there's many, many ways to kind of approach it. But that's, that's uh, one of the uh, elements that the assessment can point out. Um, Ultimately, what we try and get to here, um, and Cam, I want you to jump in, is this is about optimizing your performance. Um, it's about understanding how your brain processes information in different categories. Are you an associative thinker, a preferent thinker? That, In other words, do you, do you tend to think a bit faster, as they say, um, referencing Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow? Um, are you a sequential thinker? And then we have the imortal domains. And we'll talk to, to Pete a little bit about that today, Cam. Uh, I'd like him to to talk about the interaction of what we call the immortal domains, which are his mover, his observer, his reader, talker, and listener. And uh, it's a complicated interplay. Uh, everyone does things differently um, and very uniquely. And so we're going to be interested to hear uh, his take on it. And, and uh, he's taken the assessment and, and knows a bit about it. And we'll also talk a little bit about that and guide him through that. Um, but that said, I want to turn it over to Cam. Cam, what, uh, what has your attention? Uh, what are you thinking about here before we get over to Pete? Well, you start talking about the uh, selective or low reader. It took me right back to um, the bowels of the uh, physics library at University of Maryland back way back 
and uh, trying to get through this book, Igneous and, um, Igneous and Metamorphic Petrology. Uh, I was a geology major. I find that I'd read the same paragraph over and over. Um, <laughs> and uh, when I was actually, and so I'm a selective reader and um, thought I, you know, just, I was diagnosed with a quote unquote mild reading disability. That's what they labeled me with uh, or hit me with in about seventh grade. And, um, and so uh, a, a real quick story here is that um, I had to leave the University of Maryland or they were going to make me leave. So I left and I'm talking to my petrology uh, professor on the way out. He said to me, uh, what you need to do is you, know, you need to go and uh, read. Um, uh, it was uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle sure. Maintenance, yeah. right? Yeah. So read that, get your head together, come on back. And I'm like, okay, all right. And he's like, by the way, you know, you were one of my best students. And I just didn't understand what he, what he meant by that. So, so as he's showing you the door, he also said that, that in the past tense. He said, you were one of my best students. Is that correct? That's right. You were one of my best students. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and that totally caught me off guard because uh, I wasn't successful in the lab trying to identify uh, minerals and, and the petrology and the rocks. And I wasn't successful reading the book. Um, but what I was successful in was, uh, in the classroom of, in the discussion. And so that was my first insight really into, uh, my own active talker, uh, listener, that ability to, to, to converse. And, and so, um, this is what the CPP revealed for me later is when I did score high in the talker and listener did this. Uh, confirmation of uh, my own preferences and that when we understand these preferences we can really lean on them and then find resources in the other areas you know so finding as a high or active associative um, and that that dot connector big picture person uh, I want to align myself with people who have uh, access to the sequential side to the process to um, implementing and, and goal orientation so uh, that balanced, having, ha, giving a nod to the other side can be very helpful. So the CPP is not only allows us to really tap into uh, our own strengths and understand our blind spots, but also who do we align with, right? Who are the people we align with? Um, and I think that's one of the great challenges in the world is people will, uh, people often will hire people that they like. And often the people that they like are wired similarly. So you get a whole bunch of people who are similarly wired in a situation, then guess what? You've got group blind spot, right? You've got a whole group of people not paying attention to these uh, possible landmines or quagmires. So that's, uh, that's my take on that. But I'm looking forward to getting Pete into the conversation here too. I, I agree. And, and, you know, Cam, one note uh, from when, when in my business, uh, career as I'm building, one of the core ideas that I always had was just find the people who, who, who can tell you what you're not thinking of. Um, you know, understanding that, that with my unique wiring, I, I can say, yes, I have my own system and my own way of doing things. Um, I'm also a high or active observer and active listener, um, just on the cusp of being an active mover as well. So for me, getting into the mix, experience it, experiencing it, seeing it, touching it, feeling it. That, that, that's a way that I really took information. And, and then, of course, being able to, to bounce ideas back and forth. Um, but, but always at, at the end of uh, staff meetings, I would say, what are we missing here? And, I, and I, I wasn't, until I took the CPP, I was never aware of, well, why, why do I always ask that? But that was very important to me, uh, to, to have people contribute and say, you know, sh show us, show us that, uh, th that area that, that maybe you thought of or, or maybe that I didn't think of but it needs to be put on the table. And so, so that was a good balance for me to be able to have that and, um, and open the door for it. But I agree. Well, listen, you know, Pete, why don't, why don't I, I, I share, uh, steer it over to you to introduce Pete? Um, Cause you guys have known each other for years. Um, I did give you a little bit of lead in on Pete uh, and, and Pete, the, the one thing I, you know, we're going to hear a little bit more about you. Uh, we want to hear about community science. We want to hear what you're doing now. Uh, this, this, 
for the audience that's listening in, uh, you know, this predictive, prescriptive, evaluative uh, analytics projects in child wel welfare, juvenile justice, uh, a whole array of things that you're working on. We want to hear about that because people are definitely interested. This is the nonprofit sector or not-for-profit sector, um, which again is a little bit uh, of an area that I'm not uh, quite as familiar with having been in, in uh, entrepreneurial ventures my entire career. But Cam, why don't you uh, why don't you jump in here, if you will, and talk a little bit about uh, Pete, and then we're going to introduce Pete and go from there. Yeah, so I've known Pete a long time, and actually, Pete, you took the uh, CPP a while ago, so you're very familiar with it. It's not something yes. that's new to you. No. Um, but let's just start with. I'm a data uh, guy, so uh, what's that? I'm a data guy. I'm an assessment guy, so to me, it made sense. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start with your field, like what's what uh, the field you're in and explain to us a little bit around this uh, social science and, and uh, evaluation. And let's start there. I think the best way and I always like to start this way when I'm talking to folks about the field, who I am, what I'm doing and kind of getting cutting to the chase. But I always like to frame it this way. So in the nonprofit sector, you know, you've got a lot of organizations. There's there, there's a blur, but there's plenty of work in the nonprofit sector, which is really where you hear a lot of philanthropies, corporations, like, uh, but think the Gates Foundation, think the federal government, think state government, health and human services, think the education, Department of Education, Department of Labor. Um, and you can think at different levels of government, you can think philanthropically, there are all kinds of different vehicles organizations give. There's community foundations, individual donors. All of this is a very robust nonprofit sector. So it's a part of our economy. Um, now the nonprofit sector obviously has a very unique and, and separate role function and even legality in terms of where it sits in the, in, in the, in the world, in the United States in particular, and what it can and can't do. Um, it's all about mission. Well, in the private sector, we measure and evaluate success uh, with bottom lines, revenue, profit, different, you know, PD ratios, depending on if you're public, you know, what your shareholder model is, whether you're a public corp company or not. There are very specific ways you evaluate businesses. Um, in the nonprofit sector, it's not so easy because you're, you're not looking at a... Um, a transactional model like you do in a marketplace where people buy your goods if they don't buy your goods and get a get what they need from those goods and services um, they won't come back and so you have this this quid pro quo marketplace and the nonprofit sector is very difficult to assess and evaluate nonprofits so as you can imagine uh, and the philanthropic sector is very independent there's less accountability right because we don't have shareholders so right so even philanthropies, you know, you would think they, the way they're structured, foundations like the Gates Foundation, the Packer Foundation, you know, pro, there, are, there are corporate foundations. Uh, the level of accountability is not the same and how they invest is not the same. One of the fundamental questions in the nonprofit sector is how do we know if we're uh, successful, how we evaluate. Uh, so I started my career actually on the front lines. I was a caseworker for the homeless. I worked inpatient psychiatry with kids, mental health, ironically, I actually used to be a um, clinician working in patient psychiatry with um, a lot of kids and um, in different residential cen centers and settings. And the funny part was at the time, I didn't know why, but they kept putting me with the ADD, ADHD kids because I knew how to work well with them. And it turns huh. out it's because of my own, my own diagnosis. I literally would get pigeonholed quickly and moved over to tackling all the cases that were ADD, ADHD kids. Um, obviously with a lot of other challenges too, if they were inpatient. So we were talking sometimes a lot of other challenges in their lives. But the point being is that um, that's how I started. And that was my nonprofit beginning. Um, as I said, I was a case measure for the homeless. I was really, you know, this, this actually speaks to the observer talker part of me, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, this is really, I've always had a social bent. I then went into really the consulting side and I, I went on for my master's PhD in social work, um, like a good ADD person, I pretty much took my comps and never finished my dissertation. Okay, so I didn't really finish because it really wasn't my purpose. I wasn't going into academia. I wanted to use data and measurement to figure out how to make a difference. I always love data. I love numbers. I love research. I love to find patterns. This speaks to my associative level. There's somebody that, um, to me, um, it's so funny when I took the CPP, I came to realize um, when I saw it, it was, it was a validation of what I've always kind of known, which is that 
you know, I, I, if somebody asks me, what are you really good at? I'm a, I'm a social pattern finder. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that speaks to my observer that kind of, um, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes kind of, you know, I, I pay attention to not just what people say. I pay very close attention to how they act, behave. I, I measure it. I evaluate mission work in the nonprofit sector. That's really what I do is I'm basically saying, okay, nonprofit, you say you're here to improve the way teachers teach science. Your program is here to improve uh, children's outcomes by giving them a mentor, you know, a big brother, a big sister. And so my job is to basically figure out how to do that. And, and, and because I, my brain is wired in a way that really likes to see patterns. And by the way, I'm not very wired for the sequential. So the interesting thing that, that I would say in closing is that part of the reason I'm, I am where I am and now I've gotten to a place where over the past 20 some odd years, I've done evaluation and now converted into really the analytics space, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, what works for whom, when, and how, you know, if you hear about precision medicine, this is where a lot of data is going. Well, it's acknowledging that we need the tools. There are sequential tools of experiments that we all know when we read articles in the news that say, hey, this is what causes this. We all know it's like, well, yeah, but that's not all there is to it, right? Um, research is a very sequential process of an experiment and controlling for everything. Right. But data science, where I'm now sitting for the past half a dozen years, acknowledges the following. Context matters and it's a mess. And what we need to do is basically figure out from data, make meaning from the mess, so that we come up with simple processes rather than complex processes. For so, so basically what we're trying to do is basically get to a place with data, and this is the work I'm doing now, where we're not just evaluating, but we're actually figuring out what works. And we well, can prescribe and predict kind of what might be beneficial. Dealing with, and this comes back, I deal now in the world of, so, so a lot of research is trying to strive to, to prove their experiments, their hypotheses, okay, for certainty. Right. We're right. certain that this intervention, this pill will move the average of the population. Right. I now exist in the data science world where I'm bringing that into our social science world, which hasn't a, a, a adopted it yet, because I believe that in the real world, we're dealing with probabilities. It's not certainty. And what we want to do, and it always evolves because humans are constantly messing with it, with, with their systems. Right. Um, we're creators. Right. We're not just, you know, uh, cogs in a wheel. And so we're always changing. Yeah. So I want to I want to interrupt your high talker there for a moment. Is that okay? <laughs> you bet. That was you. a lot. You bet you. That was awesome. All right, go that ahead. was good. The thing <laughs> that um, in our conversations in the past, Pete, you know, sort of thinking about the what's different about the. You say you're an evaluator. You're also uh, in a way a, a a disruptor, right? And the way you're disrupting is it seems like the 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 cycle of evaluation. What I'm appreciating or what I've appreciated in our, last co- in our past conversations is how quickly with data analytics, <coughs> excuse me, how quickly with data analytics, you're able to get the, the information you want back to the people who need it most. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. So, so really what's happened is my career has come full cycle. So by that, I mean full circle, full cycle. What I mean is... As a practitioner on the front lines, when I had a case in front of me and when, it came, when a homeless family came in my door, okay, for, for help, um, the problem was what did we have to figure out what they needed, what their odds of getting off the street, finding a housing, doing everything, like, and what were the tools we had? That had purely to do with one database. It's called the, the brain and the experience base, right? It's like Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours. That's what it takes to be. That's basically because what you've developed is this great database. Well, most practitioners in the world and anybody in a job, most people haven't been there for more. When you pull people in their positions, they've been there one, two, three years. So they don't have that experience base. But, but I've been existing in this evaluation space, which is a, this pure science or tr- attempt at pure science of kind of going, okay, we'll give some the program, we'll randomly assign some not to get the program. Hey, the program moved the average of the whole population. And so we've advanced knowledge. This particular thing, Prozac, makes a difference on depression. However, the problem is that finding, because it's about population averages, moving the averages, right. doesn't tell me the individual on the gro- ground, the reality, which is inside of that bell curve, 
which says, well, that may be nice, but I'm not looking at somebody who can take Prozac because they're allergic or it's against their faith or whatever right. the case may be. Mm-hmm. So context is what I live in. So what data science is finally doing and the disruption where I'm moving is the social sector has yet to have what the private sector has, which is a quid pro quo, meaning if you put tutoring in the private sector, what do parents want? They want their child to pass their exams next quarter on whatever it is they're tutored on. Right. Okay? So, the, so what happens if the parents don't get that from a tutoring service that is a for-profit business, they don't come back and they don't tell their friends to get services from that tutoring company. Now, there's the same model in the nonprofit, but in the nonprofit sector, we have proxy buyers, okay? So what do we mean? We have others who are funding, donors, grant makers, government agencies who are saying, yes, pro- nonprofit, you provide tutoring to kids. Guess what happens? When they're doing that, they're the buyer, therefore the market exchange, but they're not the ones that we're judging the outcomes from, right? Right. So, so the problem we have is we have a market disconnect. So what I'm doing disruptively is basically trying to say, hey, listen, we actually need a feedback mechanism. Um, and part of the problem, too, by the way, in the nonprofit sector is when philanthropists come in and spend a million dollars to move the needle on some outcome, they fund tutoring. And then they ask me as an evaluator to go evaluate whether those kids are graduating from high school from a tutoring program, right? There's a disconnect because they don't live this in the real world. So the private sector is actually benefiting from something we don't, which is this quid pro quo feedback. It's like I, I, the consumer. So what we're beginning to do is now take all these data sets that organizations are growing of the day-to-day services they provide to people. And we're measuring those more near term outcomes and giving them feedback loops that say, they can, they can, the practitioners can predict and prescribe with higher probability because they're getting feedback right away. And we can actually evaluate case by case who's being caused to change because we're measuring those things that are more direct. We finally creating a, a sort of data driven feedback mechanism in what I call sort of this proxy buyer marketplace, if that makes sense, because we're really missing something in our sector. And so that's the disruption. So how did I see that? And how did I do that? Well, years of experience of frustration, frustration with being an evaluator who never met me, the social worker, to actually help me, which is all the reason I went into this. Right. And so, I want to, so I want to, I want to jump in for a second. Okay. Yeah. And then we're going to keep going in this direction, but I want to orient the, the listener here. And Perry, you know that uh, as, as Pete is speaking here, he's reminding me of another guest that we've had. Do you have a, do you have an idea of, of, of who he's reminding? Uh, well, he's, he reminds me directly of John Michelle. Yeah, he, he, exactly. You know, Pete, uh, one of our, our partners, our founding partner um, at, at the Avalon Institute is General John Michelle. Uh, is a one-star Brigadier General, uh, retired from the Air Force. And John, we, we've talked a lot about his associative processor, and he, he measures a very, very active associative processor. Um, he, he often... Uh, got into trouble, has some friction, uh, I think, in his career. And he, he admits this because, like you, he he saw around corners. He's able to look around a corner and say, you know, uh, I, I'm going to feel pretty good about the gray space right now. Uh, and then he would develop his, his, uh, his process was to develop a systems model, uh, mostly human-centric, uh, around solving problems. Um, and very much, very much in line with what you were saying. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and so the other thing, Pete, is that, you know, as you're speaking, and I think this is, uh, this is kind of, again, as we look at these profiles and look for patterns, you know, we're going to look for patterns in these profiles, right? Um, The thing that it's the, it's the passion, right? Both you and John are so passionate about what you do. Um, And as you're speaking, it's almost like you're invisible, because it's just for you, it's just what you see in front of you yeah. in the sense of, right, here, here's this, here's this uh, obvious disconnect that needs to happen. And so here you are, and I appreciate what you're doing now is you're starting to bring you into that. And that's what we'd like to have is bring you, let's bring, it might be uh, unnatural, right? But we want you to come in and like, okay, how does your unique wiring 
benefit here? How does your unique wiring like influence yeah. and um, sway, right? All these components of leadership, of inspiring and influencing. Uh, and there's definitely this, the passion, the connector. Um, you keep saying context, right? Is what's missing is the context. And that high associative really is wired for context, right? Wired for context and experience and, and precedence. So, so uh, Pete, let, me, let me give you an image here. So, so you, you hit on a point early when you, uh, when you started talking. Um, here's the image. We're, we're, in the, we're in the Florida Keys and the flats. You know anything about bone fishing at all? A little bit all when right, I was so, younger. Okay, so, so you're standing on a, on a flat boat and you're looking out you know, through the Keys and it's a clear day and you see a bonefish. And you've got to, you've got to, you know, the cast can be kind of a long cast and everything because that bonefish is always moving. So I'm going to reel it back in because I've, I've seen Peter's man. He's a, he's a bonefish and he's moving fast. Now I gotta I gotta throw that, I gotta throw that line out there because I may or may not get it in front of him, and I've got one shot here. So, so here's what I want here's what I want to ask you about. I too struggled uh, to to finish my senior project uh, or or what I would say you know it's a version of a dissertation because I went to NYU and NYU always does stuff differently and progressively. Uh, took me a while to do it because I, I lost my anchor a little bit. I finished it and, and did not feel correct about, you know, right about submitting it. And so I dragged my feet on it. Eventually I, I took it to my professor and he said, where have you been? He said, you could have turned this in a long time ago. The problem is, is that I, the context had changed. My context for, for, you know, the original idea behind this dissertation, uh, you know, is in communications and, and advertising. Uh, had changed, and and I, I lost my my original core idea that I started with, and and it didn't emotionally resonate with me, so to speak. So I had a hard time at that completion. I hear that from a lot of people uh, that we work with at Avalon as well, uh, especially high associatives. It goes back to the context of it. And you said you didn't, you know, you had a hard time finishing that. Uh, so I, I jumped on that and I said, wow, I, I can completely empathize with that. A lot of folks that we work with, um, and we've also worked with, you know, folks in the military as well. Um, who show up as high associatives. If, if the core mission uh, doesn't speak to them, if it doesn't drive them, if it doesn't connect them uh, as, as, a, on, as a team or you know, within the leadership structure, that can become a big problem. And it, it seems like you encountered that, I guess, a couple of times and um, you know, through, through your career. But I mean, I'm only, I'm, I'm projecting that, but, uh, but it sounds like that. Um, do, yep. do you want to go back to that point, I think maybe about yeah. this? Why, why is it that you dropped it? That's what I'm getting at. So, so I'm, I'm going to put a little more intentionality around it. In all honesty, it was so funny because, well, there was a, contextually speaking, there was a, um, a, a personal matter that, was ma that, that I was going to have to move. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't struggle as much with the decision, meaning um, I'm somebody that, and, and perhaps we can speak to it from a wiring standpoint in relation to what we're talking about, right? Um, so my observer kicks in in the following way. And this is really where the associative in my mind and the observer kick in for me, the high observer. Um, I always had a, 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 I'm somebody that, that has a path. I never thought of myself as I'm going to do this. I was, I was never one of these people that like, I'm going to be a doctor and it just never wavers, right? I have what I call a path. And I knew that I'm on this path and I want to, I want to make the world better. I mean, just, just, but I got to find my way. And in the master's PhD program that I went into, I went into it really in that, with all intentionality to learn technical skills. Okay. I was looking at it. So, so when I planned on completing my dissertation, but what happened was life kicked in and said, there's this other think tank opportunity over here and they're not requiring me to finish it. Okay. So I went, all right. Uh, and I, it spoke to my passion and here was my observer. The observer in me said, you know, if I keep going down this path, I'm going to be in a pigeonhole of a, of a researcher in academia. And I knew enough about myself prior to the CPP that I didn't like what I was seeing, meaning and I'm because of my non-sequential, which is a label I can apply now, not back then. I just knew it wasn't a fit. It, 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 like I, I, I can't follow these rules, right? And kind of stay on this one trajectory. So with all intentionality, I said, listen, 
what am I really here to do? Well, listen, and I literally, my, my uh, dissertation chair who I'd chosen and the title, she, she came to me, she said, you know, if you go and take this job and you're going to be moving, you're not going to finish. And I said, oh, I'll finish, I'll finish, I'll find a project to finish it on. And she was like, no, you're not, Pete, and it's okay. She goes, um, I'm convinced you've got what you needed. Um, she goes, but I didn't say that. Because, <laughs> because of the sequential process you must follow to get your PhD that gives all the accreditation for the university, et cetera, et cetera. But the point being is that, so, so that's kind of where I went. And, and, it's, and, and I'm highlighting something really important, which is it, it's the, it is the associative and I'm a very high associative. So I see patterns um, that, that, but that observer is really important because what happens is it constantly triggers me to say, you know, something's not right here. Right. And when I get stuck, the disruptor in me, I think, is the combination of the observer and the associative. I see patterns other people don't see. It's around that corner you were talking about. What I've had to navigate, the challenges I've had to navigate around that are that I don't fit in, meaning the, the typical leadership path, for example, philanthropy. I've kind of always been somebody that I could tell people appreciate but don't know where to put me in the uh, hierarchy or staging of kind of the sector, if you will. I've always had to come in back doors, side doors, because I'm not, I, I, I cause a ruckus in a little bit of a way, if you will. And, 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 and I don't know if philanthropy and a, and a lot of sectors, the leadership model is to plow ahead sequentially and don't cause a ruckus. That's right. So, right. Uh, so I want to jump in because <laughs> You know, we were talking to another high associative earlier in the week, and uh, she was talking about resilience, right? And she was yeah. very passionate. And the sort of resilience to keep pushing forward. Yeah. So I appreciate you bringing up the sort of the challenge, right? Because we do want to talk about blind spots, right? Good leaders lean on their strengths, but they also are aware of their blind spots. And this may not be a blind spot per se, but... Um, this this statement of I don't fit in for some people they would kind of fold up their tent and go home and this yeah. is the essence of leadership is this perseverance resilience like what had you keep opening those doors Pete yep what had well, what had you keep opening those doors well what it came down to is that you started to realize so as my career moved forward and I started to because the other thing I, I don't really often talk about, but I, I in, in hindsight, I want to just say, I'm also an inventor. And by that, I mean, um, I, I, I'm a problem solver and I create solutions. So there's a certain very specific method I've developed of analytics that that is doing what I'm doing that people are wanting. So there's an inventor part of me. And what really happened was that as I'm creating solutions, um, I came to realize that there's no way to bring a solution to market or scale with just my wiring, okay? I need the whole CPP balanced web, if you will, right? Meaning I, I, I got to have, I got to have those gap filling roles in order to uh, take solutions that derive from my high associative, you know, um, uh, observer, uh, where I then codify some solutions and how to uh, how tos, and I I do know how to to stir a crowd, but I'm usually what I call the provocative speaker. But I don't always fit in. Where I don't fit in is often the sequential process of taking solutions to market, and then being able to get the kind of interest um, uh, investment, if you will, to get to that next level. So what I've had to find in my work is is that um, it's really finding those leader partners and others who bring sequential, bring an understanding of, um, I'm balanced in other areas, it's really sequential that is the issue, that can help to um, anchor, if you will. Uh, I, I can see where we wanna go and I can, even, I can even derive a path, but what I need oftentimes is a sequential types to be able to, um, kind of actually navigate, if that makes sense. Yeah, I recall um, a couple of years ago, you referred to um, someone at, at, in, in your current, um, in your current uh, uh, organization of, the, of a role that they filled of like, kind of like just this 
establishing, uh, you know, you called it the term you, ter I think the term you used was like a, a just a gate, right? Yeah. Here are these gates that are kind of, it, it's, and they're spread out. And like, it's, I just need to, I can kind of meander and find my way, but I just need to pass through this gate, right? right. Which is uh, this concept of completion that I use in my coaching, right? Is it getting these completion or these benchmarks, you know, to, to, to so you can measure progress, right? And it gives you this orientation of, so it doesn't have to be bang, 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 bang in order. Uh, yesterday I was talking to a, a high associative and he's got a, he's got a lovely Southern draw and he's like, uh, you know, so my people, you know, they go one, two, three, but I'm like an old V8, man, uh, 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 firing uh, one, three, seven, two. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kim, the thing I would, here, here's the analogy. I, I, you know, I like metaphors. Obviously, I think us associatives, we play in metaphors all the time. But here's what I would tell you is that, that think of it this way. You know, you've got like, you know, you have your destination, right? Um, but I'm the type of person that, that, that I really appreciate, for example, the sequentials who can do the following is it, kind of go, okay, I'm going to give you a nav app. I'm not going to give you one, one path, path. Okay. What I'm actually going to do is what I love that nav apps that do that give me three, four, five different options to getting to where I want to go. And along the way, and along the way, I can actually pull up those options and see if there's some other variant options, even though my purpose is to get to the end. However, I may decide that it's not speed, that it's actually scenery, or that I need to be able to deviate. But that's the analogy is like, to me, um, the sequential really provides a really, a, a, that, that overall map that says, well, we can find some other pathways and let's work together to find those pathways without making you feel, Pete, like you don't have a choice or constraining your, your, your energy, if you will. Pete, right? let, me, let me ask you a question. So, so um, you know, talking a little bit about, I, I think that the, um, you know, I'm looking at, looking at some notes here on your bio and you say, you know, national, uh, you've created nationally recognized assessment tools, uh, automated data-driven evaluation tools like the core capacity assessment tool. Um, the, the word redundancy, you know, going back to this issue of redundancy. So, so you, you talk about the freedom um, and the gray areas that you're, you function in and, you know, the, this realm of possibility through the associative uh, processor. Do, do you take, did you, did you find comfort in the redundancy of these algorithms? And, and I, you know, again, this is way above my pay grade. Um, does that give you, you know, working with a systems engineer and saying, you know, here, here are the things that work here in these analytics. Um, but, you know, talk about the issue about redundancy and maybe some of the struggles around that. And, you know, specifically, did, did you find the balance through, through creating these things? Yeah, so if what you're getting at by meaning redundancy, it, 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 it's like um, it is this constant challenge you have, right? Because in a lot of analytics uh, algorithms, it's formulaic, right? Yeah. It sounds very, you know, um, but we're, we're dealing with... Um, I couldn't deal with those redundancies in a model that says, we're gonna study it in an experiment. If it works, we're gonna redundantly do that experiment, call it a program, and we're gonna scale it everywhere. But it has to be fidelity to that model. So you can analyze data, see that it works. The data just proves that we need to redundantly kind of do what we've always done. Um, what I love about data science, and this is an important distinction here, so there's there's research that's really striving for certainty and predictable uh, outcomes from doing the same thing over and over again. And you can use data to find those patterns. But in data science world, what you're actually dealing with is probability. So what does that mean? Okay. What it means is that you are finding for sure the patterns, like this is what works for this group of kids in the child welfare system to make sure they don't come back again and they're reunified with their family. And you can actually see these patterns, but, but where the space I'm is sitting in from a disruptive standpoint is what I'm gonna to say to all systems is the following. That's right, but guess what? Whether you like it or not, there are gonna be new variables or old variables that will change in their relevance over time. And so you have to evolve and contextually, you're going to have to adapt these core patterns in order to maximize success for everyone and not just the average. So in fact, I have found my creative data space for which, in fact, redundancy 
in a literal kind of sense of it, sequential redundancy is actually antithetical to evol evolution uh, of these models, if that makes sense. I think I, I got it. I think I think I understand exactly what you mean. So there, so my question about in, in my thinking about, you know, re repeating patterns through the technology, which, you know, but but what you're t you're saying is that this technology, and these analytics are constantly evolving anyway. So there isn't really any redundancy. No, there isn't. So I think of it like this. And, and by the way, the, how did I come to a lot of these analytics? This is the associative part of me. Sure. I became a practicing Buddhist. And so what is what is what are the centerpieces of suffering in buddhism which got me to thinking it's the suffering of the idea of attachment to permanency right when we attach ourselves to permanency which is what we all want the whole research model by the way is is the silver bullet it's like the law we want every theory to be proven so many times it becomes a law why because we as human beings there's a part of us that depends on certainty right Heaven is a certainty. This is a certainty. This program's a certainty. We want to know with certainty. This is why all the media, all the research, everything else is like, this is what solves the problem. Well, that's not true because in reality, that's where a lot of suffering comes from because anything that's probabilistic, which by the way, anything that interacts with anything is going to be probabilistic. It's changes. Systems change. Communities change. Things change. And if you get attached to the idea of permanency, a silver bullet solution, you're going to be sorely sorely dissatisfied and there will be huge suffering right there's data that shows that in our country a, a bachelor's degree in college has a correlation and people think causation with a certain kind of happiness and a certain kind of advancement in our society there are entire countries in other places europe and other places that are just as advanced as us for which college education and i give it another example home ownership are not it right and the reason being is because those systems and contexts are different. Their values, the people they interact, people don't like it, it's messier. But in data science, and when I see data and I see all these different patterns and they evolve over time, what we're finding with technology is we can understand them, which humans have to get ready for. And, and, and the, the disruption I'm causing is we have to get ready for the fact that um, there is no certainty. We can only do what we can do for now and we can increase the probability of success right here and right now. But, but stop pretending that you think that this is going to then make you the next Einstein. You got a lot of work there. There's a lot of complexity. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff. Got it. Right. I was at a uh, coaching conference and um, mm, I want to say Warren Berger. Um, I'll, I'll check that and uh, add it to the notes. But uh, he's one of the keynotes. And um, his book was uh, a more beautiful question, right? That what we do is we are uh, groups of people are striving for answers, right? They're striving for certainty. Um, when in fact, this notion of uh, asking questions, being curious. Uh, and I love the whole connection, you know, connecting back to um, the Buddhist uh, tenant around attachment to, to permanence you know, and, and really letting that go and taking yeah. that. I think that's another uh, something, a, a high associative who is, uh, who is not in a place of dissonance, right? That you know, is, is moving forward is taking these broad themes and being able to apply them in multiple places. Right. So in a way you're keeping it really simple. Yep. Right. It's a simple yep. uh, uh, operating formula, to, in order to let you, you know, move forward. The other thing I want to speak to, Pete, is you are a balanced mover. And we haven't talked about your mover, but what I notice about movers is not only do they, um, certain areas of the brain activate with movement of muscles, whether it's jaw or, or you know, you can think about just running, but not just running, it's moving, walking around, the stand-up desk thing. The other thing is, is that movers, metaf they, they like movement, uh, in a more of a figurative way, in the sense of you like flow, you like things to move along. Like, again, I'm going to course a path, you know, I want to, as you were talking about the GPS and being able to pick four ways and then get to a place and, and do it again, uh, that, that desire for motion and movement and flow is very much there for, for those who are um, either uh, active movers or balanced movers. Yes. I think that, so that's an interesting point, and I, I, I'll piggyback it in this way too. Um, so 
I'm, I, it, it's funny. I, I, I'm not terribly self-reflective of the mover uh, part of me, meaning, um, but I do catch myself. I am somebody that is a mover literally in the sense that just like I'm a talker, um, I will often find that when I'm like, when I was on the phone with you, Cam, during when we were, uh, you were a coach of uh, my, my coach, um, I'm walking around, you know, to me, thinking, moving all of it, like you can even see me, I, I, I wiggle, I move, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I you know, it, it's very much there. <laughs> but, but I want to make an observation here. Um, when you combine that with this associative observer part of me, um, I think this is another facet of, of kind of where my my passion and where my leadership really lies, which is, and it's piggybacks on what we were just saying, which is if you think about movers, um, what we're really looking for is progress, right? We're not looking for the following, which I think this is one of the challenges I've had to reconcile with my sequential friends and colleagues and, and, and people that work with and for me. Um, and that is, I think there are a lot of other people that are maybe not as, oriented that way of the movement, where it's the status. It's almost like, you know, are we making progress? Let's say you're working out and you're exercising. Um, so there's, there are certain people that are very much about a certain status indicator. What's your BMI? Once you cross that, yay, you know, we've got the status of that mark, right? right. From yeah. a measurement guy, for someone who does measurement all the time, there are status metrics you know, completed degree, didn't complete your degree, right? Right. But to me, I'm way more interested in what I call progress metrics, milestones. And, and because, uh, and the mover in me, I was always saying that, you know, really when it comes down to it, um, I don't see how, I, I, I find the, um, the snapshot, the photo, the status, I, I, I like to know we can put it in a flip book and make it into a movie, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so to me, it's like this, like, I, to me, even though I'm very present, I really believe in being present in the moment. I think that that's a state of being. I don't necessarily have to take snapshots, if that makes sense, to know. Uh, I'd rather see those snapshots together to understand the movie. Right. Well, and you, um, you speak of status. I think about uh, David Rock's scarf model, Right, that uh, brains, whether they're associative, balanced access, or um, sequential, uh, are wired for status. Uh, we are that that if if our status is threatened uh, in some way, uh, there's a there's a threat response in the brain. Um, well, when I'm saying status, Kim, I want to clarify too. I'm not necessarily meaning I, you, you're framing it. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding. Partially, it's true in terms of a hierarchy, but I don't just mean that. I'm all, I don't mean like a social status. Yeah. I literally mean that a lot of times I find that there are certain people. I was just having a conversation with my wife about this this morning. There are certain people who, when there, there's an innate um, motivational hit and a, a, a sort of a Pavlovian, you know, salivation moment when your checklist is done, yep. like, you know, your to-do list. And then there are people like me who kind of go, um, that, that, that's just not a motivator. It, it, like to me, yeah, I want to get stuff done, but it's more because I want to know that I'm making progress. So my indicator is not a to-do list with all the check marks off. Got it. This is why I've always struggled with the getting things done. The systematic way in which that kind of model works is great. I need my systems because I'm ADD. But, but, but at the end of the day, I have to acknowledge something. It is not a motivator. I don't get a pellet in a Skinner box in a Pavlovian way, you know, <laughs> just by basically checking off boxes, if that makes sense. I get a I, pellet I, I when the got... world says, hey, you're, you've contributed something. But even then, I'm going, okay, what's next? <laughs> Pete, I, I have a variation of, uh, of GTD as well. This is not an indictment of GTD. I think it's a wonderful system. And uh, yeah, me too. Alan you know, has done great stuff with it. But um, for me, I, I, my intrinsic sense of it is it just makes me less creative. You know, I, I, I can finish it and I have my, my cards and I can color code those things. But, um, but in the end, it's a little bit less than that. You know, like go, go back to this mover thing. Cause you know, a couple of things that, um, jumped out at me, if you would be when we, we've had a, a number of guests on the show and, and, uh, and obviously, you know, working with the clients that we work with here, um, I mentioned members of the military, um, the perception with those who might be a little bit higher movers uh, versus those who, who may not, you know, be a little bit less active or, or a little bit lower on the mover side 
is that the lower movers tend to look at the higher movers and say, why are you jumping around? Why are you, <laughs> you have to sit still, you're distracting, uh, you know, the group. And then the higher movers say, that person's not as productive. But, you know, the, the sense of evidence is that they're just not doing as much as I'm doing. Uh, and, and so, 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 you know, again, it's a bit of a paradox. Um, the, the example that, that you reminded me of, and this is my associative side going off here, is that um, we, we worked with uh, an all, uh, an all pro, former all pro uh, cornerback. And so I, I, in my own thinking, I said, well, I'm going to try and guess what his scoring will be. Well, it, it, as it turns out on the, on the CPP, he ended up being a lower mover. But then when we, we spoke about that and I said, can you tell me about your perception of, of this? And, and, you know, you actually showed up a, a bit you know, lower on this, on the scale. He, he had a great, a great dissertation on why he felt that a lot of the cornerbacks that he worked with, especially in, in the uh, latter part of his career, when he was acting more as a field coach, were wasting so much energy. You know, for him, it was about, uh, and he was also a very high observer and high listener, he was able to dissect the opponent through the course of the week and know exactly what he would do, know exactly how many steps he would need to take to, to, to make this type of play. And then, and then, you know, fold that into the, uh, into the entire scheme for the week. And so for him, it was about precision. And so he, he, he said that he said, look, I, I became pretty intolerant toward the end of my career. And, and this is a guy who played for the skins and, and uh, you know, he was a Belichick guy. He loved playing for Belichick, by the way. Um, but he would turn around and he would just talk about that and say, so, you know, these young guys came in and they were, they're running all over the field and I'm just looking at this. You, and he would say to them, he goes, you're just making me tired. <laughs> it's just, I'm making me so tired. Well, this, this is one of those things that I would say that um, uh, part of, part of for me is I, I believe strongly in actually what you were just saying. And let me share a little, a, a different view, a, a, a view on it. So I just recently was taking my uh, son and my daughter, I have an 11 year old son and a, six-year-old daughter and we're looking at different karate um, and different martial arts um, programs and it was fascinating to me because um, uh, there are different mover types of arts martial arts right you can go into one dojo and actually find that there's not a lot of movement they do a lot precisely um, and there are others that are like all over screaming moving jumping all around there are certain um, practices that are different. I even came across one that was so, so um, precision to what you're talking about. That is a, there's a Russian martial arts called Sistema, which is like, it's almost like a very loosey goosey. But when you observe what they're doing, it's very, it's just so precise. It's actually what the, the, the secret service is trained in because it's, it, and here's why I'm bringing this up is because um, this is one of those areas for me that I have found uh, an area that I'm striving to work on, which is um, uh, for internal purposes, which is the idea of being able to breathe, uh, come and, 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 and use the observer part of me to become more precise in the moment on what I want to do. And the reason I say that is because um, there's a part of what we're talking about, the mover, my observer, my high talker, all that kind of stuff that, that I feel sometimes misses some of the precision that, that I'm looking for. Or, and even sometimes, by the way, people don't always respond, don't listen as much. You were talking about it. It's like I find that sometimes a lot of the leadership in the world, um, they're really not movers and talkers it's almost socially less acceptable, right? So this is one of those areas where I struggle because um, I don't think it's normal. And I think there's a leadership model that I've observed that I don't fit into very easily, which it, it is that calmer, preciser, you know, um, uh, way. Now that doesn't make a right or wrong, but in my own personal life, I've been practicing more, and this is where I use meditation and mindfulness a little bit more, because I see some benefit to, to working on, um, so my movement, I've transitioned, trying to transition from my body to my breath, if that makes sense. It's like I'm trying to find the space and, and, and uh, not become not a mover, but, but think, because there's something about that role. Now, I'm not convinced yet. I'm just experimenting. But as I look at all of this, I think that um, 
it is fascinating, and especially the CPP in our conversation here, um, how this also plays out in the sort of world of work and, and engagement and leadership. Um, because what you said struck me is like, it's, it's hard to, um, uh, sometimes it's hard to fit these, these uh, aspects of yourself, these ways of thinking into kind of the mainstream. And movement is one of those ones that actually triggers a very difficult social response. I'm not ADHD, but you take someone who's ADHD, they will really struggle to fit in socially because it's, it's, it's aberrant in, a, in an observable way, right? Everybody can see it. And it seems like you're out of control, right? Um, so it's, it's a very fascinating thing to me. And I've had to navigate those waters very carefully. I'm not HD, but I, but I do it through talking and I have to, I have to you know, figure out how to navigate that. I don't, I don't know the answer. Hey, Pete, when you talk about precision, is, it, is that related to presence, right? That ability to sort of be in the moment now through your breathing and meditation? Is, it, is, that, is, yeah, there, is there a connection there? Yeah, so I believe that um, I'm learning more about the sort of the, it, it's kind of like, you know, drawing on the right side of your brain where basically uh, you learned it. Reading my mind. Go ahead. Yeah. Cause I'm, it's exactly, yeah. I, I took the course and I'm thinking about it. Go ahead. So it, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. It's like, I'm learning how to try to find, I, I do find that I, I, um, I gain clarity in the space between movements and words, if that makes sense. And so I'm trying to use the pause and practice it in meditation and other things, because I think that, um, that's, and, and, but I'm calling the pause movement because I don't want to work against who I am. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. There are other people who literally just aren't movers and they're just quiet or they're, they're still. I have to look stillness as a movement. So I have to focus on my breath because I can't deny who I am. I'm a right. mover, right? Yeah. But, but there's something I see to learning how to be in the space because um, we all work with people and we have these strengths and weaknesses we're talking about in the context of CPP or not weaknesses, but strengths and, and, and areas to be um, balanced, if you will, with others. And that's the point because a lot of this, whether we we're talking about the CPP from an individual standpoint, but in my opinion, there's this great, um, when you talk about in the context of leadership, it's social interaction. It's, 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 it's and getting movement of everybody towards a common agenda and goal and making progress. And that's really what I mean is, is we've got to find a way to find that. And, um, and how do we, you know, and one, we have to be mindful and teach the people who aren't the movers that just because we're a mover doesn't make us wacky or crazy, but, but we also have to learn for ourselves how to find some of that movement in other ways. And I find breathing and meditating, um, uh, really helps, really helps. That's great. The, um, and that's another thing that we do at Avalon is uh, bringing the CPP to teams. And I just did that yesterday with, um, with a, a, a CEO and his, his two um, uh, admin support people. And just that recognition of using this language to, have, to understand that, okay, there, there may be a mover involved here or there's a difference in movement. Um, it just is uh, creates a, an amazing shift in context uh, in relating to each other, and then it's it kind of uh, puts a pause around the whole assumption thing, right? That we assume uh, uh, humans are very natural to say, uh, why did they just um, say that, do that, you know, uh, feel that, right? Like that emotional response, and this is a little bit of information to kind of like have us create a pause here. I want to I want to talk about something. Um, you know, you're so comfortable with the language and this understanding, right? Uh, Recogn this awareness piece is uh, a beginning place for you, Pete. Right? This awareness of how you work and how you don't work, and navigating through that. I'm kind of curious about before you took the CPP. Like, what does the CPP, the difference the CPP makes? And let's go back before you did mention. You know, you, you worked with those kids and I'm, I was the same way. When I started teaching, they put me in with the kids with ADD because we taught, we just connected uh, in this, this very interesting uh, way that no one else could really relate. Um, but, but 
how was by the way i struggled with the ocds (laughs) 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 so 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 that's a whole different broadcast about about uh, (laughs) no offense to anybody in the audience (laughs) no offense (laughs) no offense sequential yeah 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 touch things Uh, a thousand times but um but like how did you like uh evaluate and analyze uh before you had the cpp just like what was uh how did you make meaning uh you I had know, a good wh- coach. yeah but before okay but thank you very much but before that in the sense of like and again it might be in the context of uh having add or again i'm i'm different here but you didn't have the language of the cpp or that understanding how was it for you um uh i've been one that's been a consumer of frameworks and tools all my life so what I mean by that is, um, and this is the way I approach even my data and analytics, which is, so I, I, I study and look at, like when I have a challenge and I, first of all, number one, and I don't know how to share the how-to of this, but um, I'm always very self-aware when I'm brushing up against a challenge I'm having. Um, I'm not, I'm not one that, um, uh, blames a lot of my external situation. I'm very internally, um, uh, I, I blame myself for some of the challenges, even if it appears at first that somebody might be creating the challenge. And when I say blame, please hear me. I don't mean that in a shame way. I mean it from the standpoint of, I, I'm, I've always been somebody that, that kind of goes, uh, there's a lot for me to fix in me. And I'm okay with that. I'm actually really good with that. It's almost a, it, it, here again, I'm going to use a framework. It's the, it, if you're familiar with the growth mindset and Carol Dweck. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, so, it, and, and, and you're going to keep hearing that. So CPP is a more refined extension and resonates for me of a lot of things I've always done all my life, which is number one, I always, I have always approached my life as uh, I'm actually not, I've never been one that believes that I'm innately special. Okay. Um, I believe that, um, I believe that, that I've always been one that kind of goes, I've got to figure it out. Okay. So I don't assume that I'm just going to be born with some special gift. And so I've never been that way. So to me, life has always been a puzzle. So whenever I run into a failure, I've always been one that goes, okay, what am I going to learn about this? Like, and, I, and, I, and by the way, I want to go right back to whatever I just failed at and, and make it not a failure. Okay. Even if it takes me two, three times, four times, whatever, I don't know where that comes from. So, so in the journey to solving those mistakes along the way, um, I've always been one that has turned to ever since I was young, um, uh, sort of, I study what's out there and what's known, right. Going back years to understanding personality to, um, you know, I, I came out of a family with a lot of um, alcoholism, so was introduced to support groups and 12-step programs. And, you know, so there's a lot of stuff in my history that taught me that there are people that study, learn, there's information and research. And so I turned to it. And so I've always had kind of these this notion that I'm not alone. There are people like me with this challenge I'm having. I just got to go find them and then find the experts who studied them and find out what it is they've built or tools or approaches they've done. And so I've always been that way. And so I've always sought, I've never approached something like I'm alone. This is a problem only I have, or I'm defeated. You you find the opportunity. You you turn this and you say, look, there are real opportunities here. And so, so it may have been a, a slight setback, but okay, what did we learn? You know, what, what, what's the next step here? You know, what was missing? Yeah, I get you, that. You got it. You got it. And there was always these, there, there was always, um, there's this wonderful, as humans, we really are, there, there's a body of knowledge that if we can tie into it, that is evolving, that we can grow. And so CPP is just, it, to me, it's, a, it, it, it's taking what we've all been learning and it, I, I can feel it being informed by a lot of historical lessons learned right? In past research, past studies, past ways of done things. This is a hack of another kind of models and other things that didn't quite get us where we needed to do. And this is an advancement of that model of understanding the way we think and how it affects how we lead and and work and and do, right? Um, That's really what 
that's really what progress is. It's it's a it's 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 usually not an invention. It's a hack of old of, of what we've known to date at just improving upon that model with a framework that resonates more. And I find this resonates very well because I never found a pure personality framework like the Myers Briggs did it for me. I never found that the strengths inventory was a really, um, it didn't provide a, a, a sort of a way to enter into what do I do? You know, this feels more like a, what I can do because, um, and the cool thing around this is the framing of this also in the context of leadership, it, it, it forces us to really think holistically about this, not just as a way to fix ourselves, but a way to interact and, and act. And, and to me, that's really what's key. A lot of tools have been very me focused or I focused, right? Um, some tools like Myers-Briggs and stuff then kind of try to make it interactional, but uh, it's a very different concept. And, and, and to me, this is the other thing I love about this, by the way, is that it's, it's really about how we process. It's about how our knowledge and, and, and how we act and do. It's, it's much more action oriented of a framework, if that makes sense. Well, I, I completely agree with that, Pete. It, it's um, it's interesting that there was uh, I was talking to the uh, to the the founder, our provider of the CPP, and he he t he said, you know, here's the difference, um, you know, for people to understand. He said that you know something like the Myers Briggs uh, talks to you. You know, it's also based on um, on you know Jung's work from the 30s, but um, it, it hasn't necessarily evolved. But it's not you know the CPP is not how you feel. It simply gives you your cognitive assets. And then, of course, it's up to you. I mean, the work doesn't stop just because just you have these scores in front of you. Just so you understand that, that you know, we're breaking this down associatively, sequentially, mover, observer, reader, talker, listener, it doesn't stop. In fact, it actually starts. Um, and, and it's interesting because as I'm listening to you talk, I, I grew up and, and I used to, to just love comic books. Well, I, I was a Marvel guy, you know, I, I liked, I liked Spart uh, Spider-Man and I, I didn't necessarily gravitate toward, toward Superman who you know, really kind of only had one, you know, issue with him going on, which is that, you know, don't give him kryptonite, but Spider-Man was great because he, he carried, he carried a lot of issues around with him. He, he came from a you know, imperfect upbringing uh, and, and he always battled out of adversity and he also found different ways. He was also a scientist as well. And he also found different ways to do things. Um, and he tapped into his best assets, but he was, he, he was, uh, you know, to, to Stan Lee's credit was, uh, was an imperfect superhero. Um, and, and so when I, when I first took the CPP, I started thinking, wow, these are, these are incredible assets. And then you also start to realize that, that, um, you, you can look at these, you know, as, as I say, a high observer and a high, uh, high listener myself, I said, wow, th you know, th these are amazing things and, and I can really start to tap into them, but also be careful because I, I sometimes, you know, may place uh, a little bit too much emphasis on these particular tools. And so there's, you know, th there's a different way of looking at it, you know, from a metacognition standpoint. Well, and that's the other thing. So, so if you really think about this framework, it's really important. I, I would just highlight here that, that this framework is, is a verb centric framework, which I really like. OK, uh, you, you think about some other frameworks like, you know, the Myers-Briggs framework or something. It, 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 it's not. It's, it's like noun centric, if you will. Right. I am. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the reason I say that's important is because and, and also you have a cognitive focus. This is the other thing I want to say about this is that um, I've never been one that found uh, sort of and I'm a psychology major in undergrad. So when I was studying Jung and Freud, to me, they were like fictional fun because I just, what I mean by that is like the psychodynamic approach and, and hashing all that out while, and I don't mean fictional, I shouldn't say that, but what I mean is it, it, it didn't help solve a problem to me. I'm, I'm a sure. cognitive oriented person. I believe that it's the way we think and yes, the way our feelings impact what we think and yes, our history and our historical variables, I get that. I just don't think there's some kind of magic formula or, or therapy, if you will, that's going to address that, right? And Young and Myers-Briggs and all of it comes out of a very psychodynamic approach, okay? Um, that feels too anchored to me in what I call history, as opposed to kind of how our history has shaped our cognitive thinking. And our brains do evolve, so we actually know there's a mind-body connection. So I like a cognitive framework, because that's how kind of problems get solved. Um, it's not an it's not a disacknowledgement of, of of feelings. I, I don't mean that at all. And I'm sorry to poo poo the. That, I'm just not a big Freudian. Like I, I, there's a lot of that. I'm not a. But 
I think young and I think some of the stuff there has value. But what we have in CPP here is is a practical, and that's the other thing. So take Buddhism for example. Why am I why why is Buddhism something to me that I find really good because it's a practice more than a religion, right? And there's a certain science to it, right? So it makes sense to me. Like regardless of what you believe about reincarnation and all the other stuff, which is what a lot of people have faith for, I, I don't want to go there. But the point is that from a from a practice standpoint, um, we're figuring out how to separate ourselves. Uh, understand our feelings, not disavow them, understand how it affects our thinking. And this framework helps us do that because I think that, I think that the way we think matters, we need to be tuned to feelings, but it's really kind of this almost the expression and everything in here is a verb. And, and what that means is that, you know, these are our preferential verbs <laughs> and, and, and it's good to know that because that's, that's really the world of living, right? Right. A status is a stop shot. It's a, it's a, it's a picture. But what this is doing is a giving a framework, right? That is verbs, meaning it's in progress. It, 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 actually, it's in motion. It, it, it's, it's action, if that makes sense. Well, and also it complements uh, the work that you do, right? I mean, oh, yeah. and, and how you've turned the whole evaluation uh, world kind of on its head to say, listen, Trying. because, well, because it, um, it really relied on history, right? Of like, yeah. uh, you know, uh, putting together an evaluation that took six months, right? And it was written and then it gets to the people who need it most and it's already six months old yep. and you know, was, was useful then, but not useful now because of this whole idea of uh, evolution and uh, adaption, right? Of, of uh, adapting and, and moving forward. And don't get me wrong, it advances knowledge. You know, that, that, that I, I agree in the advancement of knowledge, like subject matter knowledge and understanding of the world. Right. But what this conversation is about and what we've been talking about is, um, and the work that's passionately driving me, it's not about um, knowledge for knowledge's sake. It, it, it's knowledge for action, which is really what, the, what CPP uh, speaks to me uh, right. about and, and yeah. provides me insights, quite frankly. And that's the other thing. I'm all about insights from data, not data itself. Um, this, and, and this is literally insights from data data and it's um it, it, it's workable actionable useful well, we're going to take that as an endorsement is that yes, all right for sure. For sure. <laughs> you've been an awesome guest i mean i i uh i, I can't i can't, i've learned so much from you actually I, I i love the idea about uh about it being actionable and, and you know speaking in verbs and here's a question for you i'm going to shift gears and this is it has my attention it's something that we've we've talked about a lot um and i like your opinion on this uh mm -hmm. You can relate it back to the CPP if you'd like to. So I studied with a guy named Neil Postman at NYU. And Postman, um, talk about technology, Postman wrote a great book called Technopoly. Um, he, he, amusing ourselves to death, the disappearance of childhood. He, are you familiar with Postman's work at all? Or No, but I think I've got the, I think I get the gist. And yeah, the, he fairly well predicted uh, that with advances in technology, he originally focused on the television and um you know, very much Marshall McLuhan, uh, the medium is the message uh, type of thing. So we work a lot with millennials and, and millennials have grown up and also Gen Z growing up on the internet, um, uh, needing, uh, uh, changing work structures, changing workflow, um, you know, growing up with knowledge of platforms where our generation grew up with knowledge of pipelines and, and hierarchical leadership. How are you finding uh, in the work that you're doing and, and, and especially in the, uh, you know, the not-for-profit space and, and in, um, you know, in, in working toward, you know, toward you know, different social aims, how are millennials and Gen Z, how are they approaching the work that you're doing? How do they see it? Um, because the, the one thing and the example that I would give um, when I was scaling my businesses and, and uh, you know, founding the restaurants and Matchbox and uh, Ted's Bulletin, uh, I needed to adapt. And, and we, we talked about scaling those particular businesses, but I needed to adapt to what I was hearing from, from our workforce, which are you know, in, in Washington, D.C., very passionate uh, uh, young people who, who were working for us, um, you know, might, might be working on Capitol Hill, might be working as a paralegal at a law firm, might be a student. And they, they wanted to know what we were doing. They wanted to know what our, uh, you know, the, the social programs and, and impacts that, that we would have in the community uh, to be able to execute. And they wanted to be part of that. And, and, and I wonder about this because I think, I think that 
that businesses and leaders, um, you know, some will look at this and say, look, our, our system has been in place for decades and we're not changing. Uh, and, then, and then those are the ones that, that are also will <laughs> turn around and say, well, uh, we're struggling to fill jobs. You know, we're str- we, there's a workforce issue here. We can't seem to keep people, you know, retain. I hear, I hear over and over again, and, and I have a lot of friends um, you know, who, who have law firms, and, and, and they're struggling with this, asking these questions, saying, you know, can you help us with retention? What is it we're doing, and, and, and what do we need to change? And, and uh, you know, the, the one example, and I'll stop on this example, is um, I had a friend tell me that there was a law firm that was having an issue uh, retaining associates, and they were, they were you know, throwing out a lot of money to associates for signing bonuses and things like that. And it, it was almost uncanny that on the day that their, that their, their initial contract expired, these people would leave. They spent a million dollars renovating because they said, our offices are out of date. We need to have an open space office. And they spent a million dollars renovating the space because they said, oh, well, this is what they like, uh, you know, based on someone who'd come in to talk to them about it. Uh, the world's changing. Uh, t- tell me, tell me a little bit about what you're seeing, and especially I think mainly for mo- uh, millennials and Gen Z and the work that you're doing, if you will, because it's a highly associative universe that we're living in right now, and a lot of people are struggling with these questions. I agree, and I, um, my observations are, well, I, I, I share a couple things. One is I think that the millennials and and Gen Zs are um, purpose matters. So they don't, I, 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 I'm finding that um, a lot of the work I'm doing, uh, there's a lot of interest coming from that, those generations. Okay, I'm 50 years old. So I kind of grew up in the 70s. You know, I'm the, I'm the Goldbergs generation, right? Um, oh, we're right there with you. <laughs> yeah. You got it. <laughs> so, so, but what I will tell you, I've got a, I got a friend of mine, um, uh, in, in the field, a guy by the name of Aaron Hurst who wrote a book called The uh, Purpose Economy. He runs a company called The Imperative. Uh, it called Imperative. It, it, it's, um, he's speaking to this exactly. Working with companies all over the United States and world, basically really advancing this idea that, and, and this is really coming from these generations, which is that um, their work has to have purpose. It ha- there has to be meaning in what they're doing. It doesn't matter what you do. There has to be some purpose to it. Um, so that's 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 one part of and, and and as such, I think part of the recruitment and retention and engagement, it's changing rapidly. And 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 the way their purpose and change is, by the way, much more. The thing I I get um, I'm observing that I don't know how to deal with is that um, it's the immediate gratification of purpose that 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 the sort of social network. It creates it's kind of the world of we're beyond television what, what it really comes down to is rapid social feedback likes dislikes sure. and engagements that that are almost sugarcoating a generation's perceptions of how hard they have to work to achieve purpose if that makes sense and i think it's getting conflated sometimes with, with you know um sort of self uh, acknowledgement, right? It's funny that I think there's really an ethos of trying to, to help to be, to have social impact, be a part of what they want to do. But yet it's a weird kind of paradox because I think, but also getting a lot of self acknowledgement in real fast time for doing it, if that makes sense. Um, and, and so there's this, there's a challenge we have, and I don't think we understand how to do it. My observation we are not fully, fully, um, the, the generational discussion you're, you're, you're presenting or this, this, this challenge we're having in the, in the workplace has other factors at play. So it's partially a generational and what they grew up with, right? And the rapid instant gratification world, because that's really what it is. If you think about games and social networking and Snapchats and Twitter, it is rapid, rapid feedback on everything you do. Even if you have a social purpose, it's very, it tends towards narcissism because it's like, you know, part of what we have to learn as humans is uh, the long game, right? How do, how do we weather the long game? And, and technology is basically saying, you don't have to, we'll just give you your little pellets all along the way. And, and, and it's like, so it's weird. And, and, but then on top of it all, there's another dimension that's really kind of concerning to me. And this is really because I, I'm in the space of data science and specifically AI and all this kind of stuff. I am getting more and more concerned 
and I think McKin McKinsey just came out with a report uh, talking about how, what is it, there's like a huge swath of percentages of jobs that are just no longer going to be here anymore and that we don't even know exist in 15 years. So things are really shifting rapidly. And so I, I, I think um, there's a dynamic there that is contextually creating even more of a challenge. But to your point, I definitely believe that um, the millennials, uh, Gen Z, um, uh, th th that there is going to be a real struggle with hiring good people from those generations, not because they're not capable or desirous, they're going to, purpose is really going to matter. But then how do you build a business around a, a, a little bit more of that immediate feedback need that has to be integrated into it? Or how do we train that out? Or how do we kind of adapt that out? Um, some people say they'll age out of it. It's just it's just a sort of natural continuation of uh, adolescence. But I, I don't know. Um, and I think in this economy that is now becoming more micro, right? You got the sharing economy. You're you got a lot more of the gig economy. You know, you got a lot of stuff that basically people are saying, I don't have to put up with this, right? Put up with what? I call it the hard work before you get your pellet, right? It's like it's like I don't need it anymore. And so I think there's a real struggle there. Um, and a number of dynamics. So I didn't answer the question, but I think there's a number of factors at play. You, you, you did. And, you know, Cam, I'd like, to, I, I'd like you to, to speak a little bit to this as well, because, you know, the, the, way, that, the way that I have, uh, you know, to Pete, to your, your, um, you know, your explanation there, I, you know, the, the way that what I'm seeing is this is a, it, it is a, is a created, it's a, it's a, a virtual associative uh, universe. And, and part, of the, part of the issue, the Achilles heel with this is the perception of time. And let's equate that to associative yeah. thinking. Associative thinkers don't necessarily view time the same way as sequential thinkers. They view it differently. It's, it's a part and parcel in, in a lot of cases of, of whatever the process is, but time uh, it, it has a different sense of importance. I was talking to a guy who um, getting ready to graduate college and he's a former athlete. Um, and I, he, he said, you know, he's trying to get to talk, talk about a job and said, you know, can you, can you give me some assistance and I'm looking for a job uh, in finance. And uh, I, I gave him a few pointers here and there. And I said, well, what, I, I said, what, um, what are you looking at here um, outside of just getting the job? And he said, well, I need to get a job. And I said, okay, but, but from a career standpoint. And so we, we had to walk down that path because I said, I said, I, I, I want you to think about framing this a little bit. Think about framing it in terms of career goals. Um, you're, you knew what you had to do as a, as a football player within the four-year time period that you were in school. You had to train, you had to prepare for games, you had the off-season. There, there was a lot of structure there. I said, you, you, you're coming from that structure and you're going into somewhat more of a wide open universe, but, but I would just coach you and say, think about it in terms of the structure you're familiar with. Because what we really, you know, ultimately what we realized is that he, he had not really thought anything past the idea about I just need to get a job. So having said that, Kim, you know, go back to my question, you know, the, talk about this issue about time as really, you know, as it relates to the subject, if you will. And specifically to um, the associative preference. Yeah. 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 So I work with a lot of people who are um, associative preference, right? I, my specialty is in, uh, is uh, ADD. Um, I'd call myself an attention coach for uh, creative leaders. Uh, like Pete, right? Pete's a creative leader. Um, and um, I think time is very relative. It depends, you know, um, in my, in, in, the, in the realm of ADHD, there's a, there's a term of time blindness. Um, that is uh, the perception, you know, not having access to that sequential uh, really is, again, there's uh, the term of, uh, there's now and not now. Right, so it's kind of a sense of urgency uh, that's created in this moment. What I need to do right now, um, I equate it to kind of this uh, depth, uh, depth of time. Right, not be able to see depth of time in the sense of a timeline going forward, and that can come into um, uh, challenges around prioritization. Right, of in order to prioritize, you have to have a sense of uh, of a timeline. Right, what am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow? Uh, Covey has his time matrix and he distinguishes the, the important 
uh, not urgent is Q2, quadrant two. Which I think um, you borrowed from Eisenhower, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yeah. So Covey uh, borrowed a lot of things. <laughs> and, uh, hey, hey, those are hacks. That's the way it is. It is a hack. And, and again, the recognition of it, right? So the quadrant one is urgent and important. And um, a lot of the people I work with really have a hard time accessing Q2 because it's over that time horizon. So the thing that I see with associatives that I work with, it's not so much about time blindness, it's more about a, um, a variation of a value of time, right? It's like a commodity, a volatile commodity that can be uh, worth, you know, 375, you know, an hour. When you've got that deadline, when you've got to get the proposal to the client in two hours. Um, or it can be about, um, six, you know, 25 bucks an hour, right? Or less where we're giving away this time. We wholesale time. And, and so this inconsistent value of time is what gets uh, a lot of associatives and I'll say um, a balanced access people uh, in trouble, uh, uh, challenged by that. So, but just that, you know, so time is a perspective thing. As Pete was talking about uh, mindset and Carol Dweck's work there, this perception of time, how we perceive it. You know, many people perceive, again, you don't have to have ADD to perceive that there's not enough time, right? Our society is creating a sense that we don't have enough time, right? I'm behind the eight ball, I'm rushing. And part of that is our culture and this desire for more and more and more, right? The, the consumerism that has been happening for the last, uh, I don't know, someone tell me how long that's been going on, right? We're seeing something happening. Uh, there's something beyond this, this consumer um, economy we've been in uh, for so long. But, uh, you know, trying to, you know, keep up and, and move forward. And, and again, as Pete, you were saying, check those boxes, right? The game is to check boxes and do more, more, more. That comes into our perception of time too. Um, but yes, the perception for, for individuals who are high associatives, their perception of time is very dynamic, I would say that. You know, one of the things that I would comment really quickly is that, you know, when you really think about some of the things I think are struggling with right now, is, is think of the internet as, as the, the, the communal brain that is being developed, okay? And then now let's think of CPP in the terms of the, like the internet economy and like where things have gone and, and social networking and everything else. What I would say that is a real challenge right now is quite candidly, and this is going to go against myself here, but I actually worry that what's happening is our entire economy and everything right now is on a completely associative brain. Okay. Uh, so, so, so please, the problem please. is, so the problem is and our economy is structured around this. Okay. So, so what's happening is in fact, everybody's being raised. The next generations are being raised like it or not with an economic model that has shifted from sequential factories, right. And, and plants and, and production, right. Everybody knows their part. There's a sequence to how we do things. And now what's happening is a lot of the economy is beginning to shift to this very associative. I mean, even look at the way the business models are. I mean, Amazon's and everything, right? There, we used to have companies that pretty much do a certain thing. Now we have conglomerates of all kinds of stuff. We have business, the economy, everything, the internet, the, 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 like trying to figure out everything else. They're acquiring Whole Foods. I mean, it is a complete associative model. And that's the brain that is running our economy right now. Well, can and so I, when and you I, really think about it, and, and by the way, the consumer – by the way, is also now in an associative consumption mode, okay? Because before, we used to have to work hard to save our money, and we had a few things we wanted because there really wasn't that much in a consumer sort of smorgasbord. But now we, we have so much, especially in the information age, where all we're consuming is all these different information products, which is just massive. Used to be we'd have a car, a house, a this, a that, and a bank account, and, you know, you could kind of – you know, see the lines and see the past, but now it's all changing. And so as a result, I actually worry that we don't have it. Now, where's the hope? The hope in my opinion is going to be, and it's coming is in fact, what I would um, call blockchain. <laughs> what's what's going to happen is there's going to start to be some rails put in place in this economy that is going to, uh, basically not make all this information so associatively available, right? 
Right. People are going to control their lives more. I'm not going to share my Facebook information with you because I hold the key and you're going to have to ask me permission. So we're going to get into a different space. But right now, it's been an associative kind of wild west. And, and it's a little bit of a challenge. And, and that's why our workers that are coming in, they've been raised on an associative sort of model of consumption, pleasure, leisure, education. And there's still no rails in there. Right. Exactly. So I want to add a, I want to add some language because, you know, because um, over the last, um, you know, over, over this discussion, we're learning how you have really harnessed your associative preference brain. Right. And so this ability to sort of um, create a, an associative resonance. Mm. And there's um, a lot of people out there who are struggling um, who I think that, again, it's this more in the realm of uh, an associative dissonance, yeah. right? Of where there's so much coming at them, so many inputs. Yep. And um, you're speaking of, again, the economy right now, the attention economy, right? Yep. Is everyone is vying for our attention. How do I get your attention? And, yep. oh, by the way, the, the, the tech people are finding it's very simple right, to, to get our attention, right? And even building that into the, the technology of swipes and clicks and likes and shares yep. to get a little dopamine hit and it's almost like the, um, the, the you know, pulling the, uh, the roulette or, you know, gambling and the slot machine, right? Yep. Of like, I'm gambling here, what am I gonna get? That anticipation piece produces more dopamine than the actual reward that we see. Right. Who is who has liked my post on Facebook? Yeah. So that dissonance piece is what is going on. And, and I I appreciate you bringing in the hope <laughs> yes, and the that. and the way forward there. So to, I to think there is. Some. I think th I think there's going to start. I actually think what's happening is that um, things are going to start. There's going to be more funnels. I think there's going to be more tools because I think um, there's a lot of fatigue. It's basically like turning everybody into ADD and, and, and meaning like, you know, so when it really comes down to it, it's like um, we need the balance, which is really kind of centerpiece to our discussion today, which is that, you know, the thing I'll tell you the most is I, I appreciate my, my strengths. I saw my assessment, my CPP, pro, my, my profile, and I, it didn't surprise me. And I look at it and I go, yeah, not only does it not surprise me, but I like it. Like it's who I am. I like, I, I kind of like that profile, but I want everybody to feel the same way. And, and, and when you add it all up, I'm a kind of a big picture person. If everybody had my profile, we'd be in trouble. Because <laughs> it's just not going to work. Um, so we've got to have a balance and uh, you know, so that's, that's, um, that's the key. Um, and that's what I, and, and this, the, the, this framework gives us a language to help us understand that um, and an action orientation that I think can get us there. Yeah. So, Pete, we really appreciate you coming on and, and spending the time with us today. That is fun. Yeah, Pete, it's been yeah. awesome. Great. I, I feel like and, you know, so, so we've connected around our preferences and we've also connected around a few bigger ideas as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> and going back to the notion of time, you have been, uh, been very generous with your time. And again, thank you for that. Uh, let's wind it down if we will and, and let you jump off because I know you got a full day ahead and, and Cam, we can go ahead and wrap up, but thank you very much. And, and uh, I, I want, you know, Pete, you're also talking about social media, but you also, uh, you know, have, have you know, your bio and everything is on LinkedIn. And so, um, so I'm sure a lot of folks will be checking that out uh, after they hear the broadcast, but is there anything else here that you have coming up that you'd like to talk about um, that you guys are working on at your company or some, something that you're very interested in, uh, and, and rolling out. Well, so along those lines, a lot of the work that we're doing, and if there's interest, do check out my LinkedIn page. But but um, a lot of the work that I'm doing is really trying to leverage the tools of machine learning, data science, and social science. And what we're doing is coolest thing is that that um, uh, trying to generate more interest in as well is really um, we're working in spaces like child welfare, um, juvenile justice, where we can start to. You know, there's a lot of work we were just discussing about um, uh, the world of artificial intelligence is upon us, and there's a lot of worries and fears about it. Well, we're leveraging the tools. Machine learning is a sub, sub area under artificial intelligence. When it's used to learn on its own, we call it artificial intelligence, but the machine learning algorithms are a core part of it, and we're using these. 
what I want to share, and I think that people need to take more interest in, and you can go to my LinkedIn page and talk about it, is, is that um, there really are dangerous ways that it could be used to further inequities, confusion, and, and do what we're talking about, which is just take advantage, okay? Um, uh, data is everywhere. Our identities are all spread all over, and we can now grab it and make meaning from it. The work that I'm passionate about is that um, we have to start to infuse. So, so this is one of those little ideas I just wanna say, go investigate more on my LinkedIn page. To me, Science, there's a newsletter article about this, but a lot of the work I'm trying to do is focused on um, our human brain. Why did we create the scientific method is because we know as human brains in terms of cause and effects for complex problems, our human brains are terribly biased. We're very tribal. Okay, so we, we are naturally going to ascribe certain causes and effects differently to different people. We make decisions based on that. Police officers arrest kids, whether they know it or not. When it goes in the database, you may arrest more kids who are African American with the same shoplifting incident as you do whites. You don't know it, but it's going in a database. Okay, now. If we build algorithms to predict the likelihood of crime, let's go all the way to minority report. We really is scary because here's what we're doing. We're letting AI basically supercharge. I call it the sort of super version of a human brain, which is what that means is we're going to dump all those variables in and it won't matter. But if African-American, because you're African-American, we're going to say you're going to get arrested. Nobody's going to ask the question of how it's just an accurate model. We just know it. Boom. So we're going to arrest you. Okay. So we have to be very careful. The work I'm doing is saying, listen, we can't throw, I hate this phrase, but the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, in the sense that there's a lot of folks out there that are now railing against AI and the fears of it. But what we really need to do, and this is really the business that I'm in, is we have to train artificial intelligence algorithms to think in the scientific method. So what I'm literally doing is forcing, we have to force these tools to follow the, 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 the method. Okay, so there has to be cause and effect. It's not just a correlational model that's highly accurate. We cannot make accuracy uh, to determine whether you'll pay back the note or not, um, pay back the loan or not, be the primary drivers if we really care about equity and care about people being able to do things. And so this is a big thing that I'm working on and where I'm really starting to merge this stuff is um, Watson, as an example, is amazing for repetitive tasks and identifying cats, images, um, winning trivial pursuit games, all things that are repetitive or near-term tasks. Nothing better than neural networks to drive uh, self-driving cars. But one thing I will tell, because I don't get to talk to audiences like this too much, is we would not want that to then uh, somehow predict and prescribe complex social solutions to long-term problems, endemic problems in community. It's not the same, um, but yet it is going there and it may be very accurate, but it would be sad, right? Um, folks should know, you know, there are algorithms right now that based on the race of the color of your skin, that a college will turn you down because they don't think you'll complete four years without thinking through why. Is it really the color of your skin or are there other factors we need to understand? So the work I'm doing and go to LinkedIn and check it out is really trying to, for the first time, get into this space, which I don't think enough folks are doing is, putting in the checks and balances, the rules of the road. And yes, for those that don't like it, sometimes rules have to be put in place because of some of this stuff. So anyway, that's kind of my last little spiel. But um, that's the work that's really the centerpiece of what I'm doing is that I, I fear that we are um, leading in this very associative, very, you know, internet economy. It's still Wild West, but it's massive. It's on scale. And we are fabricating and, you know, building uh, a lot of the biases right along with it. And we need to put some rules in place. Not too happy about net neutrality either recently. But anyway, there we go. Yeah, big, big day for that today. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, Neil Postman used to call that. He said that uh, he talked about backstops and how we, you know, the, the parents used to be the backstop and, and now the backstops are falling away. But he said really in, in his, uh, and, and, you know, again, he was, uh, uh, you know, everything from a social scientist to, a cultural scientist, um, uh, you know, yeah, incredible speaker. But but Postman talked about the, the necessity of finding loving resistance fighters. So 
Yeah, we need laws. We need laws, whether we like it or not. You know, we need we need some rules. Sometimes we need some yeah. laws. So we don't have to overkill it. I'm not there about that. But yes, I agree. So anyway, so you can learn more about that on, on my LinkedIn. But that's really the heart of what I'm trying to do is bring these new technologies, but um, with some some uh, uh, you know awareness and and betterment around trying to use them for the right reason in the right way. Right, and some uh, sounds like com- compassion too. Right. Yeah, yeah, it, it is sincerely because we still do have a lot of inequities. If we didn't think so, uh, the past year has kind of brought out stuff that we didn't think was still there. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Hey, will you uh, will you come back and join us again? I would be happy to. This was a lot of fun. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I don't get much. enough time to, to to hang out with a bunch of. Um, I think you're all associatives. <laughs> Oh, Perry has access to associative, but he's a balanced access. He's got. I like that. You know what? Actually, Perry, that's very good because this is a nice dynamic. I really like. Yeah, it. we get three associatives. Watch out, right? <laughs> yeah, that, no, actually, that's a that's a good point. But the point being is that regardless, regardless, that more to the point, actually, to the point of this 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 time together, is that it's about um, a really engaging, balanced discussion um, and uh, an opportunity for people to to, to sort of um, stretch their minds a little bit. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank All right, Pete. So thanks a lot. All right, guys. Go ahead and stay on just to wrap it up. But uh, Pete, again, thanks for joining us, and um, and we will uh, we're going to check back with you here and everything, and keep us posted on your progress because it's some some pretty amazing work you're doing. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. You guys right. too. Thank you very much. Appreciate right. it. Take care. Take care. Bye. See ya. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something Pete does and breathe for a second. <laughs> I had a. Uh, it began the process, I think, of taking a lot of notes and and, uh, and staying with the conversation, and then I just stopped taking notes. I said, uh, "Yeah, so, uh, that was awesome." Yeah, Pete was great. great. Yeah, I think that um, you know, just like very similar to John, Michelle is really being in touch, right? Being aware, um, not focused on self, right? There's very little ego here at all. Uh, it's really about the mission, the purpose, and um, and also there's a fearlessness, right? There's a fearlessness of um, okay, the the problem is more important than what might happen to me. Um, That's yeah, and then and then the ability with the high talkers to be able to use some nuance and social grace, you know, to influence and uh, make a case, right? It's not about you're running your idea over people. It's okay. Um, I want to use his language, you know, of, uh, I have so many different notes too. Where was it? He said, uh, oh, you know, the, I don't fit in, right? right? Someone could take that and go, you know, to the re- rebel, you know, chip on their shoulder, and uh, it's really interesting how he took that and it's like, okay, I'm different. And, I, and how can I add to the conversation? How do I uh, do that? Well, well here, here's what's interesting, you know, when you, when you and, and for anybody listening, uh, your perspective might be different than, than anybody watching because we are video uh, on video as well. Um, higher talkers in, in many instances um, talk to think. They, they talk to think they, it, it's, um, the old, older definitions might be brainstorming and, and I just need to think this through or think out loud. Um, but really what's interesting, if, if, you, if you think about other people who, who you may deem you know, as, as a listener or viewer here, as a higher talker, understand that that is part of the process. They need time to, to talk their way through it. Um, in, in, in relation to that, uh, the work um, also points toward what are the cycles of that talking? So, uh, you know, I, I, we'd have to go back and look at the tape here, um, as they say, but uh, higher talkers also tend to, tend to uh, stay within the same framework to actually get an idea out. So, in other words, you might actually just time somebody who you would know is, who could be a higher talker and say, well, they, they take about three minutes to get the idea out. Right. And you can start picking the patterns up uh, about a higher talker as well and saying, okay, well, okay, it's... Uh, three minutes, four minutes, I need to let them get that idea out. Because if, if you interrupt a higher talker as well, they tend to shift gears or they may have to start over. Um, but but I, think, I think what was, was very, very nice about Pete and listening to Pete is that he, he did follow a very, very comfortable progression 
uh, when he was thinking out loud, Cam. That was my perception of it. Right. I, I didn't. I didn't feel. And as a low talker, um, I, I was sitting and in, 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 you know, sitting and observing it, and saying, "Well, you know, Pete, Pete is, is is articulating thoughts that may be going on in my head, but I wouldn't necessarily have thought to to broach those subjects aloud." Um, what, what was your sense of it? Something similar to that? Yes. And I, and I think that, um, again, he's, you know, so uh, in the work that I do, I mean, again, what, what can be associated with, uh, you know, people will sort of assign what they know. So there people who are listening or thinking about active or high talker, they might be thinking about uh, this term that I hear a lot in, in my circles is verbal processor. Right. Right. The verbal processor. And in their mind, they think the verbal processor usually is, a, again, it's the high talker and the high mover together where it's very rapid uh it's quick and uh and they can also they can also they can um sort of own the conversation um and so in that situation uh when they're aware of it uh, they can you know start to measure uh be more as as pete said more precise uh with my high talkers who are high movers too and they they will start talking you know, part of my business is um, people pay me to listen, but also they, they pay me to partner. And so uh, you know, finding ways to um, interrupt, having an agreement to interrupt right? and, and say, hey, can your, can your high talker bottom line that for me can work, uh, can work really well. Well, I, uh, you know, the one thing I did want to tell you here, and I, I a surprise guest for our show next week, um, and actually she had reached out to me and, and uh, asked about some possibility, the possibility of you coaching her is like uh, Kelly Ann Conway is going to be our guest next week. And, uh, <laughs> <how's it go? laughs> yeah. now, for yeah. anybody watching this, Cam's face was like, like Kelly on Kelly Ann Conway. <laughs> Wait a second. How do I know that name? <laughs> Cam, you just went pale. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know. Oh my gosh. Kelly Ann Conway. That is a joke. She won't be on the show. Uh, funny, but, but she is an interesting talker. That's, that's how it does activate. I, I know that um, I hope that the audience has really enjoyed this. I, I know we've had a lot of fun with this, and I have to tell you that, that one of the ideas uh, again that we that we started this broadcast with is a lot of people talk to us about about uh, the CPP, um, and the, the issue with the CPP is it, it's a conversation starter. It it can contextualize the way that your brain works. It's not about you know turning around. I think um, and, and Pete articulated this very well, Cam. Um, about saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, inner driven and I, I'm just constantly thinking about myself. He, and you saw, I think that it, he, he, uh, he really showed it. It, it. A lot of what Pete talks about is very much outside of himself. It's not about, you know, I'm just self-absorbed and I'm, I'm thinking about my thinking all the time, but, but Pete has found a way, uh, I think very effective ways to, to access this through metacognition. And we mentioned metacognition a lot. Um, and, and he's really framed it out. So, when people say, well, what, what is this all about? What is this so what? What am I going to get to? Um, there's no silver bullet to that. You can see that Pete has put a lot of work into this. Um, and, but, but he's used it as part of a tool set for himself uh, to get better as a leader, um, I, I think, to, to be a, a more effective communicator um, and also understand you know, what his best assets are uh, in addition to, to some of the blind spots that he's going you know, has, has as well. So that's really what it, what it is about. Um, and I was, I was very appreciative of having him on the show today. Yeah. The, um, what I, what I noticed that he did was sort of similar to his work. Um, you know, the, 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 how he's disrupted uh, his whole industry is sort of taking, uh, it used to be kind of, again, this top down and, and a few people holding on to, you know, the formulas or the information. Um, and then, you know, discreetly sort of disseminating it. And what he's doing is really like, let's give it out, get it to the people who need it most um, right. and let them run with it, um, own it and create their own meaning there. Yeah. So it was great to hear him. Uh, you know, the CPP is this sort of one thing that's informing uh, a piece that's just informing. He's taking it and he's creating his own meaning with it. Right. It's like, again, this uh, grassroots effort. To, and this is what we want to do with the CPP. We feel we haven't found the power of this thing yet. 
And it's like people taking it and working with it. And just what he said about the whole action elements, right? That this is more about verbs and progress um, than so much nouns and status. And I thought that was really interesting. And again, it's, that's what's available here is taking it and incorporating. Um, and in a way, as he says, uh, uh, letting it evolve and adapt. Uh, this is bigger than us. And, that's right. and the possibility is bigger than us. So that's the, that's the exciting part. What I'm enjoying about this whole wire to lead um, process and, and talking to people and, and what they're doing with it. Um, that's right. The application piece. It's really cool. And no one does it the same way. I mentioned, you know, for, for everything from athletes to business leaders and, and if they get it and they start to plug it in. And the other thing about Peter is that you can see it was a very comprehensive uh, process of, of applying what he, his knowledge. Um, you may only plug one thing in. You may say, well, you know, I, I, I always you know, knew that I was uh, maybe a bit of a, a more of an active listener. And I, I heard things or I picked up a, a nuance in somebody's voice. Uh, maybe there was an emotional nuance because I, I picked up on something that, that I heard, but I didn't necessarily hear them say directly. Uh, and, and I questioned them on that. Well, th maybe that's it. So it could just be the one thing. And also the one thing can be the starting point to understand how, they, how your other preferences interact. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, because, because again, everybody is different. Right. The, um, Pete has had... Uh, his hands on the CPP for some time um, right. that he, he took it uh, you know, several years ago. And so he's, uh, he's, he's more like a, I would say a, you know, brown belt, you know, at least in the sense of kind of integrating. Um, I think that when you first take it, it's sort of, you start with one component, whatever's getting your attention. What I do when I ask my clients to take the CPP, it's uh, go take it for a test drive. Right. Uh, go seek evidence of this profile and just pay attention to, you know, first of all, does it resonate? Um, does it make sense? And look for evidence of this out there and then we'll talk about it and whatever gets your attention. So for some, it might be the high mover. Some, it might be the, the high um, sequential, you know, and then over, to, you look at the individual pieces and then that sort of integration starts to occur. Um, and we still haven't even really talked too much about how it can be um, this, this equalizer in a team setting, right? This, uh, this tool to use and to, to sort of noticing someone else, oh, that's their high sequential at work versus, uh, you know, why is that guy, you know, so, you know, he's so hard headed, right? That's right. Um, yeah, so it gives this tool to create that pause and delay the response that maybe you don't want to have um, right. when you get frustrated with someone who's doing something different. Yeah, and that that's why we'll uh, we'll be broaching those subjects in future podcasts as well. And uh, and you know the the plan would be for this uh, podcast at this point to have have teams on to talk about um, shared language. Uh, to talk about how you can integrate it from a team standpoint. Um, and, and there's, there's so much work to do around that. Uh, but, you know, for the moment, I think, I think this was a great podcast uh, as far as, you know, working with Pete and, and his understanding of the topic. And I know my dual processor going off here in the interest of time, because um, time is resonating with me and we've been on it for a while. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we really, really appreciate your taking time to listen um, the CPP is available at uh, www.avalonleadership.com. Again, to, to talk about the process of that, you can join Avalon and have access to the CPP, uh, as well as other assessments. We have an assessment called the PDP, and we also have uh, EQ uh, Assessment 2.0, um, where you can begin to integrate this uh, uh, different aspects and different score, uh, different scoring um, uh, they each of the other assessments uh, point out, uh, you know, slightly different um, uh, strengths and attributes. Um, but again, we have to start somewhere, and that is with the CPP. So thank you very much. I do appreciate the time today, and I appreciate your time, Cameron. Uh, this has been wonderful, and we hope that you'll join us uh, for the next edition of this uh, podcast. Um, also, want to thank our brilliant producer, uh, Brendan Kaunaki, uh, for 
sticking with us and, and working through technical difficulties because we are just starting out, but, uh, but we're having a great time with it. Um, and as I said, please look us up on the internet at www.avalineleadership.com. And we hope that you'll join us uh, again next week or in two weeks. Um, primarily available on SoundCloud, but we'll also be exploring other platforms. So thanks again, Cam, and have a great rest of your day. Many thanks to our guest today. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to know more about how you are wired to lead, go to www.avalonleadership.com, where our roundtable is always open. Once again, the assessment is called the Cognitive Peak Profile, and it might actually change your life. For more info on the Avalon Institute and our advisory services and other products, send an email to info at avalonleadership.com. Special thanks to our producer, Brendan Kaunaki of Washington, D.C.-based Kaunaki Media. Please visit his website at www.kaunakimedia.com. Thanks for joining us, and please tune in to our next broadcast, always available on SoundCloud.